from my, my triplex mower. So we have two guests on today. We have uh, Chris Trudebaugh from Hazelty National Golf Club, and we have Jason Haynes. Jason, I forgot which club you're at now. I'm sorry. Uh, it's Pender so ingrained, ingrained into my brain. Um, so I want to thank you guys for, for coming here today to talk a little bit about uh, how clipping volume is done at your facilities and um, give some idea of, of how you're using it and uh, answer any questions anybody might have as to uh, what they need to do to implement it. Yeah, thank that sounds, uh, sounds great. Yeah, thanks for having us. And I'm from this currently at the Sunshine Coast Golf Club. Yep. Sorry, man. I, pre I, I apologize. My mind is blanked as I... <laughs> No worries. I couldn't. I couldn't tell anybody where you work either. So uh, yeah, the Jim Anger Memorial <laughs> Junior Golf Course. It's the it's the course with the longest name title ever. So uh, yeah. <laughs> so thanks guys for coming. We appreciate you being here. So do any of you guys want to hop in right away? I mean, I guess the first thing I'll say is that my little course we don't do. We probably don't do as extensively as you guys do. Um, it's just me and uh, two seasonal high school college guys. Um, so, and we have a triplex mower. So we usually do it, collect clippings from, again, our full sun green and a full shade green to get an idea of what the two microclimates look like in my nine holes. And then I'll usually do green speed um, from a couple of greens too, um, from the exact same spot. Some of those greens that I'm wanna collect data from, just so that I can kind of see, hey, are things changing or are green speeds going up or down or, or what's going on um, to help me make those management decisions. So. Uh, can you explain about what, what you guys do? So, Jason, you want to start? Or? Well, yeah, I mean, kind of kind of touching on what you just talked about with models, I, I, I probably over collect the data, but a lot of that is because I'm really curious about uh, building models and predicting the future um, to whatever extent we can. Um, so we do measure uh, clipping volume every time we mow on every single green. Um, we also do have three different types of construction on our greens. So, um, you know, it, it does kind of help me with that. And, and then we also are in a, a climate where like today it's, uh, you know, January 21st, we're cutting greens. Um, but the, the interval in between greens mowing is uh, sometimes two to three weeks, but they still do grow and they still do need to be cut. So, you know, again, predicting when we need to mow, um, whether or not it's practical is uh, to be debated, but uh, for at least for the interest and just having that general awareness, uh, that, that's kind of why I do it. Chris? <laughs> that, that pause is my cue, I guess. As you cue. <laughs> um, sorry, like everybody else, like Bill, certainly, I had this terrible light situation this time of day in my office, so I'm a little bit shaded, but... Um, uh, yeah, you know, I think I would probably split the difference between Jason and, and, and Bill a little bit. I, I think we collect a lot, um, not as much as Jason, and nor do I spend as much time with, I think, playing around with the modeling ideas that Jason does. And that isn't to say that that's not valuable. Um, I've sort of retroactively gone back and done some of the, the um, thing he's, uh, some of the stuff he's looked at with like growth, growth ratio and um, I find it really interesting to see that I'm getting what I would ideally, I think, want there on that growth ratio, despite not really paying attention to it during the course of the year. So I guess that sort of means I've got a good handle on, you know, what it is we're trying to do. Um, we, we collect from every green every day, or not every day, but every time we mow. Um, we found that it's not particularly difficult, nor does it take a particularly large amount of time for, for the guys to, to do that. We have a good system for it, which is pretty simple in that the guys will dump their, their basket into a, a five gallon pail that's, that's graduated with, with leaders on the side. And then they'll just put that into their phone. And then when they get done with it, they WhatsApp it to me. And then I put it into the spreadsheet and it's a pretty um, sort of very simple system, but it works, works really well for us. And it gets us the information we need. Some, I, I have, um, one thing I've, I've heard from people when I talk about this, uh, is they worry that the, the, the data is not clean enough or not accurate enough or that, you know, different people will measure in different ways. 
And my comment has always been that because I'm not looking at necessarily each individual green, but I'm averaging it out across the golf course. And then I'm also paying attention to a seven day average on top of that, that all of those sort of spikes and, and um, pits that might come in that data from different people collecting it just kind of get rounded off. And, and it's not overly concerning to me. Um, you know, the, the other thing just sort of that I think is really interesting. And I found this out this year and we started to, for the first time since I've been here, we ran triplexes or a triplex on greens at some point this year. And it is amazing how much more consistent um, you get on your volume from a triplex than you get with walkers. When we send out four to six walkers every day or three to six walkers, the numbers are, you know, they're reasonable, but you see them for each machine. Each guy has a different way of mowing and that affects what the clippings are like. And um, when that triplex goes out, that thing mows the same on every green and um, there's no spikes and pits with the, with the triplex. It's almost exactly the same. So in that sense, I think any, any differences you see when you are mowing with a triplex are then coming because of the growth rate on that, on a particular green versus uh, how an individual might be, you know, uh, manipulating the handlebars on a walker. So, um, you know, look, I, Go ahead, go ahead. Just along that point quick. So do you think that error is coming because of differences between setups of individual walkers? Or are you seeing even the variability differences within just who's, you know, green to green within the same piece of equipment? Um, I think there's some variability green to green. And look, we're, we're fortunate enough that all our greens are constructed the same at the same time with the same grass and they all virtually have perfect sun situation. So we just, there's not a lot of um, differences that we find. Most of our differences are down to like traffic, the amount of traffic that, that is coming on those greens. Um, so I think Bill, that those differences are mostly from the, the way that, this is my impression that the differences are coming from the way that an individual operates the mower more so than the, the differences in greens. There might be some variability in the machine. We have a, a excellent mechanic. Um, and so his setups are really, really good, you know, but, but bed knife wearing is, and real wearing will give you different numbers as well. But I, I definitely think the biggest variant variation comes from the, the differences in the way that um, uh, employees operate the machine. Yeah. Jason, when you use triplexes, right? Um, yeah. Do you, do you measure from all the buckets, from just one bucket? Uh, what kind of process do you do um, when you're measuring from a triplex? I measure all three buckets. I used to do just the middle bucket because we would alternate cleanup cuts. And, uh, um, and, and I found that the middle bucket was about 33 about 30 percent a third of the uh the clip vol uh you would get on average um the reason i do all three now is mostly because i'm i don't want the clippings to be disposed of all over the golf course uh, like you know taking those poa seed heads off our greens and dumping them in the rough um you know some of our green surrounds really suffer from just really poor turf conditions because of all the poa that's in it so i want to collect all of that in the bucket and then take it to our compost piles so it's, it's, it's a secondary utility is why we measure it. I mean, I want to haul that, those clippings off anyways. And I also don't want to um, just empty one of the three reels on a triplex mower and then have the other ones weighted down by clippings. So I want to uh, empty them. And, and then, and you know, just another kind of side thing is I want the operators to empty on every green. Uh, in, in the past, uh, they would go three or four greens on a, without, before they dump the baskets. And as you go on, there's more and more weight on those reels and uh, the height of cuts going down. So I want them to empty on every green uh, anyway. So it really doesn't, um, it, it, you know, the measuring part almost is secondary at this point, um, even though it was the primary reason to start collecting clippings. So guys, what are some of the things that you've discovered from doing this now for years that you never would have picked up on um, before you started doing it? Like what are some of your biggest aha moments, takeaways, or what are some management um, changes you've made as a result of what you're doing with, with clipping collection and 
visualizing that data? So I think um, this is my, this 2021 was the fifth year that I've collected all this. And I think over those five years, we maybe had three or four mo days of mowing in which that we haven't gotten the data for various reasons, usually just because it was forgotten or, or something, but that's just how consistent we've been with it. Um, one thing I can say just to kind of start this is that um, one, what I've found over five years is our incredible ability to maintain consistency um, throughout the season and then from season to season. So like, as an example, um, I've added up the, the nitrogen removed um, from clippings. So I have a formula that figures um, 4.8% nitrogen tissue content, and then um, translates the, the dry, the, the volume into a dry weight, and then estimates the nitrogen removed. And so um, based on that last year, over the course of the whole year, we removed approximately 1.08 pounds of nitrogen. And then in this past season, 20, that was 2020, 2020, 2021, we removed 1.05 um, pounds of nitrogen. So we we're off by like three hundredths of a pound in the two years. And, and that's not, that's not even looking at, that's not a metric that I look at. I don't pay any attention to that. That's just having gained a consistency in the way that we apply PGRs and apply nitrogen and mow and, and having that consistency then um, have us be able to just replicate that day after day after day and, and year after year. So, you know, I just, it's gotten us to the point where I can feel very comfortable about how we can, we can provide the product this year that we provided last year. Um, I think, I think the biggest thing I've, I've, I've noticed, Bill, is the amount of nitrogen I apply. Um, having gone up since I started this, I thought when I first started collecting clipping volume that my goal was going to be to apply some really small amount of nitrogen and have as few clippings as possible. And what I've found over the years is um, I want to apply more nitrogen um, and have more growth but not, and then, and then manage the clippings by PGRs rather than try to manage the clippings through, um, you know, lower nitrogen. So that's USGA greens, um, you know, which obviously are, are losing a lot of N as, as the season goes. There's just not a lot of nitrogen holding capacity in those. And, and that's what I've found. So from 2017 to 2021, I think our nitrogen has doubled. Um, and we just control the clippings in other ways, mostly through uh, through PGRs to get a consistency in, in what we're looking for. So. And that's something, obviously, Bill, you, you've talked a lot about, you know, and I paid a lot of attention to the, the work that you've been doing. And it always interests me and makes me, you know, want to tinker a little bit. But what yeah, I, I think like, we've, Jason, before we move into you, I just, just to kind of go along that same point, and then maybe you can mention it too. I mean, so let me just show... Um, one of the things that we, we did with uh, Greenkeeper this last year is um, you can add, add your clipping volume quickly. So I just put some fake data in for the last couple of days. So imagine I got two quarts per thousand, two liters per hundred square meters, whatever unit you're, you're comfortable working. Um, you know, for me and my course, generally, I want to be somewhere around one to one and a half quarts. It seems to be kind of my number. And there is a little bit of flexibility in there, depending on, again, how you sample, how tightly you pack the clippings. But on our uh, growth management tab here, it's doing some of the math that Chris was talking about. So, um, you know, year to date, um, or last seven days, um, if this maybe I have more, maybe year to date, which isn't obviously very much here. Um, but we we would have uh, been averaging about 0.9 quarts uh, removed per green per day. Um, the total clipping volume would be about 15 quarts removed year to date. Um, and then it does that math for you to make the conversion of, of volume, which is easier to measure than weight. And so if we dried the clippings down, removed all the sand, that would be about one 1.25 pounds of, of dry clippings. So if we put those assumptions into there of, of about four to five percent N and about uh, 0.5 percent phosphorus and about uh, two percent potassium. All of a sudden, now we can start getting these metrics of how much fertilizer have I actually taken off. And uh, 
I can look over here at my fertilizer applied and I can see, all right, how much of, have I applied? And so um, one of the things that we have been uh, doing at Agar this last year is trying really aggressive PGR programs to shut down our growth rate. And what we ended up doing is shutting the growth rate down too much. Uh, and so we'd have to fertilize more to kind of counteract all of that suppression. Um, so when I looked at middle of the year, you know, the amount I'd removed of fertilizer was like eight tenths of a pound. The amount of I applied was like 1.8 pounds, right? It was just like, this doesn't seem like a really effective way to manage my fertilizer uh, by, you know, trying to chase my PGR program. So I really tried to transition to, I'm fertilizing to keep the greens good enough, the density, the color, the disease, the recuperative abilities there. If I'm seeing thinning moss, algae, dollar spot, then I'm too lean. And if you, um, and so we can kind of separate those two thoughts now where you have your, your turf quality, if it's going bad, use more fertilizer. And if you are worried about green speed or too much growth, then you can get more aggressive on the PGR, but not kind of flipping that model where your growth is so low, your flipping volume is so low that then you have to chase with nitrogen. It's not you know, away. And so I, I transitioned away from that this, this year and it became a lot more efficient. And I think Jason, you've, you know, you've really taken some of the modeling and uh, what you're doing with fertility additions to the next level too, um, on your side, um, to try to become more um, precise in your fertilizer additions. So what are some of the ways that, that you're using this data to kind of help manage um, growth rate and uh, manage your inputs? Well, I mean, the, the the original reason why I started measuring clippings was to schedule mowing. Um, we only have, like, I'm at an 18 hole facility now, I used to be at a nine hole. We didn't have the, the resources or budget to brute force things. If growth rates were high, uh, like double cutting is, is not even a, it's not even worth mentioning because it's not going to happen. It's going to take us eight hours to cut greens if we double cut. Um, we can't do that ahead of play. It's a, not happening. Um, so reducing mowing, especially in the winter months when disease and disease spread is a problem. That was the original uh, intention. Then you start to kind of uh, you know put two and two together with your fer fertilizer applications and how those are impacting uh, your growth rates. And you know um, when I started this, the common thing for me was a massive gross flush in the spring. And then another one would be in August, we get this massive again gross flush in August or we could, we barely keep up, but we literally needed to cut twice a day, um, but we can't um, just because we don't have the resources. So just kind of started fine tuning my uh, fertilizer, specifically nitrogen um, applications just to, to get uh, the right amount of growth. Um, and then, and then you got to get to the point where you start reducing that fertilizer um, and, and then you, you know, speaking for myself, you know, you go too low, uh, and, uh, and that's probably worse than over applying uh, nitrogen. Uh, you start getting problems with traffic and uh, other summertime diseases like uh, we, if you have poa greens and thracnos um, and uh, you know, the, the chemical control for anthracnos just, if, if you have anthracnos, your problem isn't, you know, not enough chemical. It's probably that your poa isn't growing quick enough. And uh, so avoiding those problems, um, in the summertime, especially at my new course where, um, it, you know, I, I haven't been here for very long and, and the greens here just, they just try so hard to die in August with uh, anthracnose. So making sure that we apply enough fertilizer to keep them uh, growing fast enough um, that they're, they're not kind of going backwards. Um, so that's kind of some of the main reasons why I, uh, I use it. Jason, I know you, you you also collect clip things. Um, and um, I actually, one of the things you told me during our PGR class was how you schedule your management for the next day, kind of based on what kind of growth rate you're, you're seeing today. Um, and I've, I was in a talk in, in Philadelphia area last week. And I mean, that alone was all of a sudden some actionable data that um, those superintendents got excited about and thought like, I will do it because of that. So can you explain how you schedule your management as a result of what you're seeing from your clippings data? 
Sure. Hi, guys. I'm in royalty today. Nice to see Jason and Chris. It's awesome. Uh, so, yeah, guys, I've been collecting clippings for about three years now and following suit. I generally collect clippings on, on my 18th green, which is the first green we mow in the morning uh, near the first tee. It's 10,000 square foot green. It's relatively flat. It's a, um, a Reese Jones style golf course. Anyhow, my for us, our sweet spot is 10 liters in that clipping, in that tote, uh, and it's consistent every day. We know our mowing's consistent, our rolling, single mow, single cut, and we'll do a ball roll and our firmness, and we'll get a performance metric. And then what I look at is, for us, if I'm at 10 liters daily, it's usually growing enough that it can handle the traffic, the mowing, it's in a good spot. If that number drops, you know, we try and keep our moisture at a certain number. We have a turf guard on that green, which really helps coordinate some of these things we're seeing in the field. I just have the turf guard sensor on that green, which I really love, to be honest. Our greens are top dress push-up style greens, which have some really good benefits. But I was telling Bill that um, if we get 20 liters, if we have a rain event or the moisture spike where we get some mineralization, for me, my litmus is if I get 15 to 20 the next day, I'll double cut because there's something about, you know, mower set up with mechanics of such a huge role in that, that smoothness of surface to try and get that optimum uh, ball speed, so to speak. So for me, it's uh, it's a trigger point. If we get 20, double cut the next day to try and get it back because of that friction. And for me, I'm trying to get that smoothness effect, right? So yeah, so for me, I'm trying to control moisture as much as I can, not dry, but keep it low. Because other than rain event for my greens, they evaporate, right, um, to dry down. And so that's it. So I'll stop at that. But yeah, so 20 liters is like, uh oh, they're too quick. And in Canada, Jay would know this. We have Primo. We might get a new this year. Other than that, we don't have any of the PGR. Uh, I shouldn't say that. Bill's got great modeling with DMIs. So we've been trying to incorporate DMIs in our program because, like Jay said, we'll have a flush in April. It'll slow down in May and June, which is great. And last year, for the first time, I started using some DMIs on our POA bank greens uh, for July, August, and we had much better control on those surges. Uh, but certainly, at 20 liters for us is, uh oh, we got to get back. Like, we got to get it back to where it needs to be. So, I'll be fine. Um, yeah, I mean, that, I agree with everything you say there. And it's, it's actually kind of interesting. Um, the more people that do this and they start kind of figuring out the numbers that work for them, the more that 10 and that 20 uh kind of surface now i mean it changes for the time of the year but but as a general rule mid-season you don't want to go below 10 and uh and then 20 is you know i think your conditions are going to suffer because the growth rates are too high so i think um it, it's it's been interesting to me to hear people all over the world kind of come to that same conclusion um you know there's no i haven't heard anybody yet say oh yeah we like 40 a day uh nobody's Nobody's out there saying that. And I haven't really heard many people that go below 10 uh, say that, you know, over a, you know, you go over 10 for a couple of days or a week maybe, but if you sustain that, uh, it's not sustainable. I mean, you're not going to have good conditions. Um, and, uh, and for us, the 10 in the winter time is our trigger point. So when we expect to get 10, 10 uh, milliliters uh, or 10 liters, uh, that's when we go out. And today we're mowing, it's been a week and we're getting eight. So we're pretty close. Um, but I don't want to go out and cut two. Just, I mean, it's a waste of time. Yeah. So, and, and, and like you, uh, and, and probably anybody else who does this, uh, I do use it for tomorrow. Like, do I need to send out a greens mower tomorrow or can we just roll? Because rolling to us is, it's like, it's 25% of the cost. Like I can, I can save 75%. Uh, it's faster, less plant stress, and it's just the cost of the equipment and running that equipment is, is just much less than a, a greens mower. So that's uh, something else that we use it for. It's really crazy. Uh, you know, some of the things we've been doing at the par three course is just trying to mow really short and, you know, and then being able to look at greens growth rates in the shade versus in the sun. And, and then we did a kind of a little tournament simulation with some afternoon mowing, mowing um to kind of simulate us open type conditions or other major championship conditions and 
it just how the mowing itself too affects that growth rate. Um, when we brought our, our green speeds from our mowing heights from around you know 105 to to 80, and we see this huge surge in growth rate. If not for just for a day or a week or a month, you know, month and a half, two months of a big growth rate surge. Um, as that plant is going under that stress of mowing, or when we were running those tournaments uh, scenarios, um, we were actually slower in the, uh, from we were mowing in the afternoon, and uh, we were getting more growth total off of those greens from those additional mow mowing uh, operations. And, you know, it was, it's just really eye-opening. And I think one of the things that is good to just think about in general um, from lots of different parts of turf management, like you mentioned with the mowing versus the rolling, is um, when we're doing a practice, understanding that it might be doing a couple different things. So like if you're aerating and top dressing, you're aerating, you're making holes for infiltration, and then you're top dressing to fill the holes, but you're also top dressing heavily on the surface, right? So that's your organic matter management. Or if you're mowing and you're rolling, the mowing is really just getting a uniform surface. Even the rollers on the mowers themselves are giving that kind of green speed benefit from the mowing. Um, and so there's a lot of those types of occasions where it's easy to kind of lump in this practice is doing these things, but it's trying to differentiate like what is doing what. Um, and, and that's a kind of an important thing in all precision management is to try to figure out, you know, what is a practice doing um, in one particular uh, attribute. And one thing too is really great was the, um, this last year and we mowed really short this last year just to kind of see if we could do it we were at 80 and i know there's people out there that mow less than that but um our sun greens they were fine at 80 they were growing still um those shade greens they were really growing early at 80 they did not like it and so they were just pushing so hard and then what happened in in august their clipping volumes went from like two liters or 20 milliliters per per hundred or per or uh, two liters per, uh, two quarts per thousand. And they went from like two or more, and then they were struggling to be at that 0.7. And what, what are they doing? They're thinning out, moss and algae is coming in. They burn so much sugar. And you could visualize how much sugar they were burning compared to the full sun greens that were just chugging along right around one to one and a half quarts per thousand, right even for the entire year. And so it really illustrates the importance of carbon dioxide carbon dioxide or carbon uh, partitioning, whatever those sugars are going. And it's also a number that you could bring to your greens committee, get actionable data. Look at how much faster these greens grew. And you say it's because they're trying to outgrow the trees, they're burning all the sugar while they're doing it and they thin, they're thinning out. This is why we need to do tree work. That's another kind of type of data that you could be generating. And a lot of these people in your greens committees they have business backgrounds, they're doctors, they rely on data all the time to make decisions. If you give them that kind of data, that's information that's powerful to help you get those trees removed on those certain greens. I mean, I can go to the parks now and say, yeah, I know this big oak tree that is 100 years old and honestly it's rotting, but no one can see that because it looks beautiful, but it's rotting in the center. In addition to that, we have really bad shade on the sixth green and it's thinning out and it's and, and this is why we need to spend four thousand dollars because we're spending more time and money babying that green as a result yeah and i mean bill you uh you know back when before you were managing the golf course you you kind of noticed that with some of my data with the, the shady greens can i share my screen i can show you my yeah networks, definitely my data um all right we'll go here so you guys can see my spreadsheet here yep so you can see the highlighted spot. This is our second green and it doesn't receive sunlight for five months of the year. Directly to the south of this green is uh, 200 foot tall old growth trees that there's no way in hell that they're gonna let us touch. So you can see here when I started, this is 2019, the growth rates here are high. Look at this, 85 mils in, uh, in March 16th uh, compared to the rest. You know, the average here, 14, we're getting 27, we're getting much higher. Now we fast forward to today, and we're not mowing it right now. We stopped mowing it through the winter. But you can kind of see through here, it, it is slightly elevated still, but it's more or less closer to the average than it used to be. So we maintain this green differently for obvious reasons. I mean it. Um, and, and now actually, like it was commonplace to close this for four to five months a year to have a play on a temp and, and be completely out of play. And so we haven't closed it now in the last 24 months. 
uh, it's been it's been open. And uh, just by being aware of you know how much faster it was growing, um, we 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 skip mowing on it. We do keep PGRs on it through the winter. Uh, primo, I mean, with the growing degree day model, it, it you know, one app lasts you almost all winter. But um, just kind of uh, watching that growth rate, and then and then as you can see here, as we get into the winter, uh, early November, usually mid October, depending on the weather. Uh, of course, we just we just completely skip mowing it. Um, so that's that's kind of it, it's kind of an interesting thing to see those different mi microclimates, uh, and then help you just make really easy decisions. Like it's really easy for me to skip fertilizing a green. Um, you just drive past that green, right? It's, uh, um, it, or, you know, to, to go out and just apply a PGR to a few select greens uh, if you need to. So that's been uh, another kind of neat thing that I've noticed dealing with shade. Chris, oh, yeah. Hand up. Yeah. Yep. yeah, yeah. Um... Hello, everybody. Um, hey. Kalle from Sweden here, Europe. Um, I'm really interesting about it, the click volume. Um, and I think we have we have only one golf club in, in Sweden who measured that. But what what if, if you're going to start this uh, thing, what uh, what do you think? What, where should you start? Uh, how many greens? Um, what, what is your best tips? Uh, because I, I think um, I want to spread this in, in Sweden. Um, so, yeah. Um, what do you think, guys? I would start with one green. One green? Okay. And, 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 and get your staff excited about it and tell them why. And for me, we hit a green. We did it because it was a pretty decently performing green. It wasn't a weak green. It wasn't, it was a good green, you know, and, um, it was somewhere where we could take a clear, transparent toad. It was easy. And we got the stuff. We're, we're harvesting lettuce. We use yeah. that analogy. Like we're, we're harvesting lettuce, right? Like a crop in a sense. And so we would get the kids excited. And so every day they know. And we they would leave it there. We'd come by and we just took a Sharpie visually. And we'd put one, you know, one liter, two, three, five, 10, 20. And we sort of yeah. told the guys like globally, like whether it be Micah in Thailand or Bill Kreuzer or Chris or Jay, that this is cool guys like let's see where we go and so we we figured it out intuitively that 10 was good like we weren't going backwards the green wasn't suffering from traffic or you know disease if it was 20 or more or a rain event and for us the first year was about you know we had a rain event and the kids couldn't believe it was 40 liters like it went from it was 400 percent increase in growth without any nitrogen and it was just rain alone and so then we started taking it to the membership and they were like what's that for and so we sort of told them that we're trying to control our role so we could have a more consistent product. And then from there with Greenskeeper app and following Jay and, and Bill and, and Chris, it's, it's evolved. So that's my tip. Just keep it yeah. simple to start. But, but uh, do you have also a cool Excel file or spreadsheet or how, how do you collect the data? Is it paper or is it Excel? That's the best way or the, the Greenkeeper app? But um, I don't think we have. It's not no no um, no golf club in Sweden that have the the green keeper app uh, so far. I mean, I, I'm not getting paid to say this, and and doing a lot of spreadsheet work. I think best easiest way if you're not a spreadsheet master is is probably to use something like Green Keeper app because they do all of the crazy math for you. Yeah, um, yeah. There's because... a lot of people. Their barrier to entry with this is the math. Um, yeah. You have to adjust it. Every green is a different size. You have to adjust it. Um, but the reason I do it, I don't use Greenkeeper app, is because I'm experimenting with all sorts of crazy stuff. I have. Yeah, I saw yeah. your, I saw your if then statements on your uh, file right there. There's a lot of complexity there, right? And exactly. So I'm, I'm no problem, no problem with that for sure. Um, and and I, that's not even the growth prediction model. This yeah. is just actual. The model is a whole nother set of complexity. Yeah. So let me just show really quick. I won't try to plug this too much, but I'll just show how easy it is in Greenkeeper. And we're actually, I'm working with my developer to make it even easier now. You're on your homepage. You just click the add performance data. And then we made these profiles. This is a Chris Tritterbaugh suggestion. Uh, so if you're entering the same data every day from the same greens in the same order, 
So like if I have my, when I'm out doing my PGR research, um, I have a PGR performance uh, data set. And so you can have your staff write it down and then you could come in and you could enter it like this. So my turf quality, and then I can put in how many courts I'm receiving and it's really doing that math for me. So if I put, if I got three courts today on green number one, which is a small green, that's a lot of growth. And I can also do green speed or whatever. And you can do them one green at a time. So I'll just go mow that green with the triplex, do those couple of data points, push save. Uh, and it is optimized for mobile. So if I go to uh, simulate what a, a mobile looks like, uh, that view, you can see it rechanges so that it's easy to, to enter those data right from your phone. And we do have all the European paperwork. We had hired a lawyer. So if anyone in Sweden wants to use Greenkeeper, there's no reason that they can't, they can't use it to do it. Yeah. Um, and so you can just go through, add the data uh, right there, and then uh, have it displayed uh, right in a chart, which we're actually... Um, going to a prettier chart um, with like seven day averaging, things like that um, for this next growing season. So I have a, one of my six computer science guys working on even making this better for this growing season. But that's just the, the quick plug of, of how Greenkeeper can track those. Data. I, I think but that's, that's pretty awesome. And I, despite that, that suggestion to Bill, I, I have not used it myself for that. I'm kind of like Jason, you know, I created my own spreadsheets and I, you kind of uh, like, I would liken it to like a person, a golfer who, who plays these clubs and they're maybe some custom made like forged blades and they love the feel and they love, you know, the response that they get from them and they know exactly what they, how they hit the ball or how they miss hit it. And it's really hard to go to something that might really improve their game, but they just don't want to give up that like personal touch that they have with those clubs. And that's the way I look at it. Like I, I have this, personal aspect to how I have my spreadsheets. And I'm not saying it's the best way to do it, but I, I know exactly. And it's hard for me to then go over to something like uh, that as great as that looks to put all that in like that. It's, it's hard to, it's hard to make the, I feel like I'd be doing th two things because I wouldn't give up my spreadsheet and I'd be doing it there, but we'll see. Maybe I'll do it. Maybe I'll well, do it. I mean, it, it, a lot of it's psychology, right? Like it, it it was a lot of work for you to figure out how to do it the current way you're doing it. Yeah. So to have to relearn it is, is yeah. a challenge. But yeah. having said that, I mean, even with me, uh, you know, data management and I mean, Bill knows all about this. He spends way more money in data management than I do. Mm -hmm. um, it's a lot of work. And, yeah. and you know, like uh, uh, every year, I feel like I'm a little bit closer to switching over to Greenkeeper app because yeah. it's like, oh my God, the data, the data. And it, for me, it's a hobby, really. Um, but uh, I would recommend uh, having somebody else do the math and the, the heavy lifting. Well, yeah. that, that's the recommendation that I would give. You know, Kelly, I would say uh, yeah. that I would not recommend that if somebody's going to get into it, they do it the way that Jason and I have in like creating your own spreadsheets. I would yeah. find, uh, you know, like the Greenkeeper app and, and start doing it that way because it makes it so much more simple. And, you know, it's interesting because you you would have been at the very beginning of this for me. You were here for the Ryder Cup. And at that time, I wasn't doing any of this. Yeah. And, and Michael Woods was here and he was just like practically begging me to like take these take this data during the event because I know he just wanted to see what it was and he was super curious. And I just couldn't I couldn't get myself over that mental hurdle of like, how am I going to track it? How am I going to do it? And then that was part of in the next year, the year after the event, I thought, okay, this is how I'm going to keep myself really engaged in a year in which, you know, compared to the last year, we don't have anything going on here. So um, yeah. that was sort of my, you know, getting over my hurdle and, and um, yeah. yeah. And, uh, but um, Bill, can, can you convert um, like the, 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 what do you say, the, the counting in, in the green keeper app to, to Europe, um, uh, uh, square meters, kilograms, or is it possible? Yeah, so everything, uh, when you set up, we have both metric and US, and for our Canadian friends, like Jason <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Jason, that we, uh, you know, both, uh, you can do both. So oh, okay. th yeah, those yeah. are both options there. Um, actually, if you looked at mine, I still have it in liters, even though I'm measuring quartz, because those, you know, the accuracy between quartz per thousand square feet and liters per 
100 square meters, you're talking about a difference of like a couple percent. So not accurate enough that is important for measuring something like clipping volume. So those are pretty interchangeable, but for all the other mixing stuff, yeah, everything in this in there it can be milliliters, liters, hectare, 100 per, uh, per 100 square meters, whatever, they're all in the app. Can I, okay. can I add one, one more thing, Callie, too? Because I think that one of the things that's important, and I've told people that you may collect this data for some long period of time, a year, let's say. I felt like I did it for a year without really knowing anything about what I was getting. Um, and, and that can be hard. Like I, I have a lot of patience for that kind of thing, but most people don't. So when I think about Jason's way of, of taking, Jason Griffin's way of taking, um, taking one green and almost immediately, if that makes sense, um, creating something that uh, they knew what they were getting from it. Um, I think that that makes some sense. I, my own personal feeling is like, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do, I'm going to do everything. I'm going to check all I've done every green right from the beginning. I don't know that that's the best way for a person to do it because I think that there's a, you're accumulating a lot of information that you may not know what you're doing with, but, but Jason's point about, um, you know, they had the, they had the, the, the vessel right there behind the green, it's 10,000 square feet. So there's this immediate um, relation of, you know, how many liters it is to, to liters per, you know, whatever they're, they're measuring. And, and, and then immediately both the employees and the, the, the employees doing the mowing, the management employees, the members have something they can look at and they can start to understand what they're getting out of that. And I think that makes some sense. Like not everybody has the patience to collect data for a year, like, uh, you know, Bill, uh, a researcher and, and just really not be knowing what they're getting from it. And then, you know, uh, two years down the road, you go, Oh, Hey, yeah, there's, there's some information that I'm getting from this. I, I will tell you the first two or three years I did this, I really didn't like the, what I do and the way I manage the, the greens because of this didn't really crystallize for me for two to three years, but I don't, that's my experience of having the way I picked it up. I don't think it has to be like that for somebody new to it. I, I will say one more thing. Um, it's interesting to hear that that Jason, both Jason sort of schedule their mowing for the next day based on what they get. Because one of the big things, I'm gonna share my screen real quick. Um, one of the things that, I, uh, that I've, I've started to do or realize that I um, want to do with this is I wanna mow as little as possible. So um, this is an example. This is June and July of 2021. You guys can see this, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so see all the zeros across the bottom here? Those are all days that we didn't mow. And I counted it up. It was 24 days in that period that we didn't mow greens. And you can see, I mean, in some cases, it was three days in a row. Like that might be a Saturday, Sunday, Monday. And then I'm using green speed to determine if we're okay doing that. So um, I'm not worried about what I get when I mow. I'm worried about what the seven day average is. So you can see our seven day average per day is less than 10, sometimes significantly left it less than 10. If we were getting that seven day average by mowing almost every single day, we would absolutely, the greens would be just worn out. Um, but we're not, we're getting it through alternating between mowing and rolling, sometimes skipping two days of mowing and just rolling some days mowing two days in a row. You can see the two fives here. Um, so that's the way we're getting that seven day average. And for our, our own um, particular um, setup here and bentgrass greens, which you know aren't very traffic tolerant and are pretty small in some cases, that's the best way to get good quality turf uh, in our, on our course. So um, it's, it's interesting how different people do it. I, I don't know that you'd wanna share that bill with the people on the East Coast in Philadelphia because they love to justify like, doing all kinds of work so they would probably look at this and think what like you're how can you manage a, a you know great course with that kind of mowing frequency but uh, we make it work so. yeah um how much time do we got bill uh we got six minutes so uh <laughs> well uh do you want to talk about or can i share kind of the model and sure. that i use yeah um i'll just share my screen again here uh Firstly, just, just to see how complicated the spreadsheet is, look at my formula at the top here. That's just for one cell. So, you know, the more you look into this, the more complicated things get. And uh, if this kind of makes you feel dizzy, then probably don't use a spreadsheet. <laughs> um, did you guys see the switch to this tab? Yep. Right. 
from still in the spreadsheet. So this, it kind of the bill, you know, he started opened up today talking about models. And the models are kind of interesting because at different times of the year, the grass grows at different rates, or it should um, from what I've seen over the years. And so what I found is something I started doing um, over the last probably three seasons is comparing the actual growth rate to the uh, model growth rate. And so I've just created my own model. It's nothing uh, to really brag about. And, and I know Greenkeeper app is working on a model. And I think eventually the ultimate model is gonna be something like uh, what they use for weather forecasting an ensemble, a bunch of different models kind of averaging out. Um, but anyways, this, this blue, dark blue line here, all that shows is that I am, the grass is growing faster than the model would suggest. And I can go back, uh, we can go to growth, see if this loads here in enough time. It's uh, a lot of data being processed. Um, this is the growth ratio here for the last, last year. Now my model, every model's wrong. In the winter time, it's not very good. But you can see we come into the season last year, growing it a little bit quick. Now we wanted it to grow quick because we were putting on 150 rounds a day on grass that really wasn't growing um, because our borders were closed and nobody went down to Arizona. Um, as the summer progressed, the growth rates go down. And then, and then here, our growth rates actually kind of plummet. And, and um, we had a whole bunch of external uh, issues uh, with government and an extreme drought and having to replace a 350 meter water line right across the entire golf course in August uh, in 10 days before the uh, regional district was gonna close us down because we had a leak on it. Anyways, we kind of had to put green keeping aside. Anyways, our growth ratio, every time it does get down lower, that's when we run into disease problems in the summer. And then uh, we were able to get things back up to, to kind of where we want them. But, you know, kind of comparing um, your actual growth. I mean, all I, all I really wanna really mention is comparing your actual growth to your ideal growth and every month that's different. Um, and, and everybody can kind of, I mean, you don't need to have a, a complicated model like I have. You can say in, uh, in May, I, our target is 120 milliliters per square meter or, or liters per 100, uh, 100 square meters. You can just kind of have a monthly target and then compare that uh, to where you are to help guide your, you know, how much PGR is, what rates you're using, and uh, um, and then your fertilizer, and everything else. Yeah, and that's and that's you know, that's great. And I, I love what you said about you know ensembles and and uh, maybe having multiple models that are they're helping us get there. Uh, I know like Dr. Soldat's been working on models that have pretty high accuracy using your own data, and we're trying to add those um, uh, to Greenkeeper so we can have something that looks like this. Because one of the questions I get asked all the time is how much PGR do I need to apply? And this would be an easy way of seeing it where the blue line is your actual growth rate. The purple line is the growth rate if you didn't use a PGR. So we can actually back out the PGR effect. And so I can see where I would have been without the growth regulator. And this is for my real data at my golf course. And then we can predict forward where that projected non-PGR growth rate would be um, going forward the next two weeks. And if you see that it's continuing to go up, that would say, hey, you need 60, 70 percent clipping yield suppression at that time. But if your growth rate for the next two weeks is going to decline for some environmental reason and you stayed at 60, 70 percent suppression, well, then your blue line would probably go below your ideal and you have potential for problems, uh, you know, thinning out um, all those issues, disease. Uh, and so that's the way that we're trying to help give some of that guidance in Greenkeeper to take all the complexity that Jason just showed or the models that Doug is making that are, you know, really complex and just develop them down into one graph that can just, you know, quickly show uh, what that, uh, where things are going um, over the next, you know, couple of weeks. So a lot that can happen here. If you are interested in using Greenkeeper, one of the things that we're building is this that sold that model uh, and bringing it in. Um, so if you are using your own clipping data this year, we'll be able to use this year's data in Greenkeeper to build the sold that version of growth rate for your 2023 season. So um, that is something that our team is working really hard on to hit for, for next winter. So, but we need data for this year to, to build those models. So 
Um, it's noon. I want to thank everybody for, for being on today. Um, it's uh, always great to, to have you guys on and, and have this discussion and see even how things are evolving from year to year. And um, if you have any questions for them, uh, you can always uh, uh, reach out to them I, or I can reach out to me and I can forward their uh, questions on um, if you weren't able to join us live here today. So thanks, Jason and Chris, and for all of our um, uh, students that are able to make it. And I look forward to, uh, to talking to you guys live uh, again next week.